And I want to welcome you on behalf of the Curve Vital Energy Lecture Series and uh, the Initiative in Contemplative Studies uh, here at Brown University. Uh, Contemplative Studies looks at the practices uh, throughout uh, history and across cultures of uh, increased, uh, either through sitting meditation or moving meditation, increased focus and concentration, and increased circulation of vital energy um, that uh, improve health and wholeness and well being. And we do that from scientific, uh, humanistic, artistic points of view. And we emphasize the integration of the normal third person at a distance study that happens um, within the academy and within science and the humanities. And we combine that with a critical first person perspective in which we teach and we study the actual experiences and practice themselves in uh, classrooms and labs and in our lives. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, who is the director of this series, uh, Dr. Larson D. Fury. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second round table now in the Catherine Kerr Vital Energy and Health and Healing series. Tonight, we have the great honor to welcome back three of the most renowned Qigong teachers in the United States, uh, Ken Cohen, Harrison Moritz, and Yang Yang. Uh, so I'll introduce them in the order that they've come to speak with us so far. Uh, so Ken Cohen, MA, began studying Taoist healing, contemplative, and martial arts in 1968. The only lifetime apprentice to Taoist abbot Huang Gong Shi. He was also influenced by his professors at the University of California, Berkeley, most notably Michelle Strickman, Edward Schaefer, and Wolfram Eberhardt. Ken was the first person to lecture about Qigong in US medical schools and is the winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award in Energy Medicine. His programs have been sponsored by the Mayo Clinic, the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum, the American Cancer Society, and numerous cultural organizations. Ken is the author of The Way of Qigong and more than 200 journal articles on spirituality and health. Harrison Moritz is the founder of the Taoist Studies Institute in Seattle, Washington, a teacher of internal martial arts and Taoist cultivation for over 40 years. He is a 21st generation Longman Taoist priest, a 19th generation Chen style Taiji Chuan master, and a second generation Hunyuan Taiji Chuan master. He is a recognized formal disciple of the Chen style Xinyi Hunyuan Taiji Chuan founder, uh, Grandmaster Feng Jiuqiang. A particular relevance to this series of talks in memory of Dr. Catherine Kerr, he was also the instructor who designed and taught the Qigong program uh, that was used in her final research study, the Vitality Project conducted here at Brown University. And finally, last but not least, Dr. Yang began learning Tai Chi and Qigong at the age of 12 and went on to study with many famous masters in China. He won awards both in numerous competitions and as a teacher of note. In addition to his expertise in the techniques themselves, he's also an author and researcher. In 2005, he received a PhD in kinesiology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and went on to combine his multiple areas of expertise in his research, publishing many peer-reviewed papers and implementing the findings in his from his research in his teaching of Qigong and in Tai Chi, developing forms of evidence-based Tai Chi and Qigong, which he is teaching through his Wachi platform. At different times, uh, interestingly, each of these exceptional teachers studied with Grandmaster Feng Jiuqiang, and therefore they share in the same lineage for a portion of the techniques that they continue to transmit. Um, so in the last few months, each, each of them have given talks for this series, and tonight they will respond to questions submitted by the audience and will also converse with each other. Uh, we will begin with the questions submitted earlier through the questionnaire mailed out earlier this month. And if you think of a question that you would like to ask while we're uh, conducting the talk, please feel free to post it in the chat for the, one of the, the nice things about these virtual, virtual talks. And we will try to address it uh, if there is enough time at the end. So now, without further ado, I would like to begin with uh, the questions that were submitted previously. So this will be the first question. Uh, and. Uh, We'll begin by asking in the, the order in which our speakers have come here. So we'll begin with Master Ken Cohen, then go to Harrison Moritz, Master Harrison Moritz, and finally go to Master Yang Yang. So 
So to begin, uh, the first question, how would you respond to someone in the scientific world who believes that there is no need for a traditional framework for understanding Qigong? That is, that the practice can be deracinated from its traditional context. Or on the other hand, what about a practitioner who feels they already know the value of the practice from the tradition and therefore doesn't need some sort of scientific confirmation? So Master Cohen, and I will. Sure, I mean, those are two different but uh, related questions. The first one again was how I would respond to someone who says they don't need a scientist who says they don't need the traditional explanation of how qigong works yes well unfortunately i think there is a kind of uh almost uh how do i put it imperialistic attitude towards medicine in the west the the assumption that only the western medical model or only the, or the scientific method is the only pathway towards truth. That to me is actually a religious statement rather than a scientific one. That is, there are some people who will throw away the data, the observation, when it, when it doesn't match pre-existing theory. For me, the, the theory, the model of explanation is only that a, a model and there are different ways of explaining the same phenomena. You know, I remember, maybe I should try to answer this with an anecdote. I remember one time, way back in the late 70s, I had the honor of being invited to speak to a group of surgeons at uh, a medical school in New York State about Qigong. And I decided to focus on the Leo Chifa, so-called six chi method, popularly known as the healing sounds, where you use a combination of breathing, sound, visualization, and sometimes movement to allegedly purge the major internal organs of CHE, chi, of, of toxic chi, of toxic energy, or, or stagnant energy. I try to express how it works only in Western scientific terms as best I could. That is, I said that we all know that the internal organs are held in place by fascia, by connective tissue. If we didn't have that connective tissue, all our organs would sit in a lump in our gut. And the fascia is subject to various stresses because of habits of movement, breathing, cognitive habits, and certainly emotions, such that an internal organ could even be displaced slightly from its normal or optimal resting position. And that displacement has a direct effect on organ function. Well, I could see from the audience there was a lot of agreement, and I suggested that maybe these movements that physically focus on those internal organs and often use a kind of gentle contraction and release while making the sound was affecting the resting position and the fascial tension on those organs. I also reminded them of the then new research that was done by Candace Pert. I think she had just published her landmark article in Advances Magazine about the neurotransmitters the so-called molecules of the emotions, that we now had a mechanism to explain how your mental focus, your E, you know, the saying E Dao, Qi Dao, the, where the mind goes or where the intent goes, the Qi goes. So we now had a model to explain how when you're happy, your, your heart is happy, your liver is happy. There are happiness molecules bonding to sites on the immune cells and on various internal organs. And this is before we even knew about the enteric nervous system because now, I mean, I couldn't explain it back then, but now we also know that there are actually more neurons in the gut than in the spinal cord. When you're dreaming, you could attach electrodes to the abdomen and measure the same sort of electrical stimulation coming from the abdomen as comes from the brain. We could actually ask the question today, is your Dantian breathing? 
But in any case, going back to this lecture, I spoke to them about fascial tension, about the effect of movement and movement habits on health, on the molecules of the emotions, the neurotransmitters. And I asked them afterwards, I asked the audience, so how many of you now think that Qigong could be effective? Well, they all raised their hands. And I said, I got news for you. Now I delivered the punchline. I don't believe a word of what I just told you. My way of explaining how this works is as follows. There is a subtle energy in the body that perhaps has some measurable correlates. That is, we can't say what chi is in and of itself, but we can measure the effect that chi has on our instrumentation. So one measurable correlate may be fascial tension. It may be changes in your brain waves. We know that when you go into an alpha theta brainwave state, your mind is, has a better capacity to influence aspects of your metabolism. But these are only correlates. What chi is in and of itself, we actually do not know. And I don't think there is a reason that we have to know. What we do know is the effect of chi and the effect of doing qigong exercises. And to me, a more apt model of how it works is that your mind directs the qi. And in that process, through specific exercises, such as the Liu Qi Fa, also called Liu Zi Jue, uh, the six word secret, through these kinds of exercises, you can actually move qi in your body because stagnant qi is like stagnant water. If, it's, if it doesn't move, it becomes a breeding ground for disease. You can move qi, you can rid yourself of toxic qi, and you can even gain fresh energy. So anyway, I continued explaining a little bit about the sort of Chinese model, a little bit about acupuncture. And I said, this is how I think it works. So then I said, let me ask you a question, which is true. Both, both are true. There's no, there's no need to assume that only one lens, only one way of looking at the human organism is correct. They're complementary. If you prefer to base your work and your understanding on the Chinese model, fine. If you prefer the Western model, fine. But please don't assume that you have the only access or the access to or only explanation of truth. So I think that would be more or less my answer. Well, that was that was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, let's turn now to Master Moritz. How would you respond to someone who says, well, scientists don't need a traditional context? So um, I think there's no way to understand Qigong without understanding the context of Qigong. So th there's um, layers of refinement and interconnectedness of Qigong and Chinese culture. Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But I think that the practice and experience of Qigong opens the ability to view and understand the context of Qigong. That the practice itself as the practice unfolds, the understanding of the view unfolds. And that there, to the extent that the practice deepens, the understanding of the view deepens. To the extent that the deepening of the view deepens, the ability to uh, further the practice opens up. So, I want to talk about a couple of examples of um, of, of the context. So uh, in so Thanksgiving Thanksgiving food. So we have uh, pumpkin pie, and what what's in pumpkin pie? 
pumpkins or yams or something like that and sugar and but what else is in pumpkin pie? If 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 that if pumpkin pie was basically those things, you know, cream, butter, those things, you'd eat it and it would just sit in your stomach and you'd feel pretty uncomfortable. But what's added to it is nutmeg and cardamom and cinnamon and all of these uh, digestive herbs that help digest the food. And so people eat uh, lamb and they eat it with mint jelly. And, it, and it's exactly the, the same thing. Now, did the people who started doing that study Chinese medicine? Probably not. But we can understand from Chinese medicine why that works. So, so saying that we need to, uh, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell a, a, another story that I think is really, um, so when, when I was uh, a young teenager, uh, one summer we went to listen to uh, folk music at a Jewish community center. And there were woods outside and everybody sat in the woods and listened to the music. And you could tell how good the music was by how quiet it was when they finished. In the fall, it started getting cold in Indiana. And so it moved inside. And the, then the musicians were on a stage and everyone was sitting in chairs and everyone clapped after each song. And after the first time, I, I didn't want to go back again. So th there's a, a, a wonderful poem that was uh, inscribed on the back of a, a Qin, uh, Ming Dynasty uh, Gu Qin, this, this traditional Chinese instrument. And um, I'll, I'll try and send it to you in the chat later. I, my email didn't come through to myself to, to get it on this laptop, but Yue Yin Chang Zhang Shui, Feng Wei Di Lu Qing, Hui Dao Wu Shang Chu, Fang Zhi Tai Gu Qing. So the imprint of the moon is in the water of the long river of the Changjiang. Slight breeze, the dew drops are clear. Able to arrive at the soundless place. Only then can one know the sensibility of the ancients of, of great antiquity. So this is talking about exactly that, but playing the qin and after the qin is played, so, so, so that the sound arises from that place with no sound, that soundless place and returns to that soundless place. And so, my, I'd never heard of the instrument Guqin when I was 16 years old, 15 years old. I, I, I didn't know anything about Chinese language or Chinese poetry or, and yet that sensibility was the same uh, not exactly the same, but approaching that same meaning. So in Qigong practice, there's, we, we look at, um, so Dantian. So if people practice Qigong, everybody's heard of Dantian. But where's the Dantian? So different systems use different locations for the same name. And other systems use different names for the same location. 
So there's a whole layer of being able to understand the internal context of that practice that's easily missed. There's two big categories of practice. Yo wei zhi fa, wu wei zhi fa. The practice that's doing method and practice that's don'ting method. And so what's been primarily taught and understand in the West is the doing method. But the really profound effect comes from the wu wei zhi fa, the not doing method. So both are necessary, but But the, the really profound layers come from the Wu Wei Zhi Fa. That was a very profound answer to, <laughs> to a difficult question. Well, I, I, I thought it was, I, it, it was interesting because when I first read these questions, I went, oh, these are terrible questions. And I looked at the questions again and I went, wow, these are great questions. So. <laughs> So a little bit of both, I, I guess. Opportunity. Opportunity. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, let's turn now to, to Master Yang and uh, what your response is to the, the scientist who thinks there's no need for a traditional context or for the practitioner who thinks there's no need for science. Okay. Um, you know, to the scientist, the first I would say, uh, welcome and then first uh, thank you for being interested in studying this topic and uh, as a scientist uh, which is true you don't we question everything and then in terms of like a framework let's say it is based on the qi theory and each of us is endowed with qi and then um but through the contact and then generations of the masters and who practice, they accumulated rich wisdom, how to develop the qi, how to develop your capacity. For scientists, if we want to generate better questions and come out with the best practice, it is better to understand the framework and the context so you, we can benefit more people there. And I'll give you an example. For example, there's a statement from the famous statement from the Tao philosophy, the stillness the, is the mother of a movement. In the context of martial art pushing, and then the stillness, the standing, the sitting, the lying down meditation combined with movement, it generate amazing significant results for your martial art skill and specifically for balance. Now, if we understand this philosophical concept and the principle, as well as the method developed on, around this concept, I think definitely you generate the better results if you study balance. This is just an example. And for our traditional practitioners, modern science led to a rich array of knowledge, technology, and advanced medicine. So that is great asset to help us to understand our traditional practice. And then, uh, you know, it will help us to understand why and one and each of the essential elements in our traditional practice can generate the benefit. So we can come out the best design for ourselves as well as for our students. 
And then so science is a best tool to study any practice, not only Qigong. And so I think we should welcome this great opportunity at this great time. So for both camps, um, I would uh, mention one thing, which is uh, Zhuang Zhi's uh, uh, famous story talking about all our views is limited. Whether you're a scientist, whether you're a traditional practitioner, it, the example is that our view is look like uh, a frog at looking at the sky from the bottom of the well. So we all can elevate our perspective. And then so we work together to advance the understanding of this great art and to benefit humanity. That's my answer. There's something very poetic about that, about that view and all mm -hmm, working yes. together. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the next question actually ties into this pretty pretty well in, in terms of the, the kind of a technical question about how to do the scientific research. So scientific research needs reliable measurements in order to progress. You need to measure something. So what sorts of indicators do you think are the most important or promising to the study of Qigong? And related to this, when working in a more traditional context as a Qigong teacher or, healing or healer, what sorts of ways do you measure your students or clients' condition and development through practice? Is there any point to trying to measure qi itself, either from a traditional or a scientific research perspective? So let's turn first to Master Cohen. Okay, <laughs> big, boy, these are big questions. So uh, okay. the first one, in a sense, I started answering when I responded to the earlier question about uh, things that can be measured. But let, let me see if I can be a little bit more uh, specific, because I think you asked about uh, indicators that perhaps qi is being activated or that there's some effect, some clinical effect of the qigong. Uh, so here, uh, here's what I think. Uh, let's look at first measurable factors that again are correlates of qi while not explaining away the mystery. Electromagnetic fields, very promising. We need to remember that in the West as early as, the I think it was the 1930s, uh, Harold Saxton Burr, who was a Yale University uh, physician and professor, he coined the term L field, the life field for what he had discovered to be the fluctuations in electromagnetic magnetic fields around the body that seem to correspond to a person's state of health and state of mind. Uh, when I was a research subject in the Menninger Institute experiments from 1983 to 1995 called Physical Fields and States of Consciousness, the researchers found that in, com that in comparison to 600 control experiments with people who claim no particular healing ability, all nine of the so-called exceptional healers, I was among that group, were able to produce extraordinary electrical surges, both on the skin, that is of their own bodies, and as, a, as measurable electrical fields around the body. How did we measure that? Through sensitive voltometers that were attached to a copper wall in front of you, a copper wall behind you, a copper subflooring, and a copper ceiling. And uh, I'm not talking about measurements in microvolts or millivolts. These were entire voltage surges, uh, that is body potential surges on the skin measured with an electrode at the ear and the ankle, as well as significant electromagnetic field changes. This seems to me that, it seems to me that this kind of dian chang, right? Uh, electromagnetic field, electric field, has some correspondence, some analogy to a qi chang, to a qi field. And uh, again, you did not see it in people who did not have any particular kind of, you could say energy medicine type training. So I would say uh, sensitive voltometers could be used as an indicator, perhaps even more sensitively, uh, squid magnetometers to measure slight 
changes in magnetic field, and also EEG, uh, a very important indicator. So much so that I would even say there's a kind of uh, almost brainwave signature indicative of the Qigong state, where you find a great deal of alpha and theta. I mean, basically, most people are in a quick brainwave state. They're in a state of some, I would even say mental agitation because we're using our left hemispheres far too much. And we've tended in our Western educational system to ignore body knowing and also intuitive knowing. So when you start to downshift to the slower brain waves, it's like a more quiet sea, less waves hitting the shore per given period of time. If you downshift into the alpha and theta state, you're in a more intuitive state and more in touch with your body and the messages coming from your body, including signs perhaps of imbalance or disease before they reach the point that they would appear on the doctor's tests. And this is when we wanna treat them, when, there's, when the problem is technically still subclinical. You know, it takes what, about eight years for, uh, from the initiation of cancer for it to show up on a mammogram, let's say with breast cancer. Well, by the time it shows up, it's in some cases almost too late to address it effectively. Whereas you can, in my opinion, often address it more easily when it's just starting. As the I Ching says, misfortune is long in the making. So catch misfortune when it first begins. So again, I would say electromagnetic field meters, uh, EEG, uh, now we're seeing something else, by the way, a great deal of gamma, ultra quick brainwave activity among people that do uh, Qigong. And this, this is interesting because uh, there was an article in Scientific American a few years ago, well, actually now several years ago, that showed that uh, when someone is able to produce gamma brainwaves uh, while in a meditative state, it seems to prevent the degeneration of the neurons which precedes dementia and Alzheimer's. So there could indeed be a cognitive effect in being able to generate these brain waves through Qigong practice. Also DHEA to cortisol uh, ratio. DHEA is popularly known as the body's anti-aging hormone. And it's in a kind of seesaw relationship with cortisol, which is your major stress hormone. Cortisol, by the way, is a neurotoxin. I remember one, uh, I was listening to a lecture from a well-known cardiologist and she gave some extraordinary statistics. She said, I think it was five minutes of anger, which produces a tremendous amount of cortisol, results not only in a three hour brain bath in toxic chemicals, but several hours of immune system depression. So is it possible? I, I think so that Qigong raises DHEA levels and lowers cortisol. I think so. Does this need more clinical, more data, more experimentation uh, to prove it? Yes, absolutely. Also free radical activity, that is you're doing a lot of Qigong is kind of like uh, taking just the right optimal dose of vitamin C and vitamin E and other free radical scavengers. No wonder some of the research coming out of China has shown increased levels in superoxide dismutase. When you have higher blood levels of superoxide dismutase, you have a better ability to get rid of these highly reactive oxygen molecules that basically rot and rust our body. There's the way oxygen will rust, will rot an apple or rust a piece of copper. So we, we do want that free radical scavenging activity. And uh, uh, also things like your know, respiratory rate, degree of relaxation, you can measure these pretty easily, heart rate, and uh, something that's very promising for the future uh, I'm thinking of the research of Fritz, uh, the great physicist Fritz Albert Popp, uh, that is measuring biophoton emissions, light emissions from the cells among Qigong practitioners compared to non practitioners. And hopefully in the future, we will have a truly non invasive way of using biophoton emission as a diagnostic tool. And perhaps this is in part what a Qigong healer is tuning into because you're, you're getting a kind of global sense of that person's qi through your 
Ting Jin. You're listening to energy ability through your ability to sense the Qi Se, uh, the Qi appearance. That is your energetic first impression of your student or client. I know there's a saying that the master uh, doctor of Chinese medicine can write the prescription as the patient walks through the door because of your impression of their energy, your feeling, even the sound of their footsteps, because everything that a person does is an indicator of their energetic state. It reminds me of something that Ralph Waldo Emerson once said. He said, what you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. Well, this, this is the realm that Qigong helps us tune into. And, you know, I think one of the greatest benefits of Qigong in terms of preventing illness or as adjunctive treatment is simply increasing our ability to listen to our bodies, to sense what's happening, to sense when something is going wrong. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, the I Ching says misfortune is uh, long in the making. Now, I know I've spent a little bit of time, so let me just quickly try to address that second part of the question. I think you asked for more uh, sort of traditional context, what you're looking for rather than what the scientist is trying to measure. So here, here's what I would say. First of all, there's the classic qi gan, gan jue de gan, qi sensations or qi feelings. That is subjectively, as the practitioner, you'll feel one or more of the following as a possible sign of qi activation. Warmth, weight, weight in the sense of groundedness, as when we say qi chen dan tian, she sinks to the dantian or sinking to the feet. The warmth, weight, vibration, a vibratory sense. I think it's the Taiji classics that speak about the chi should be felt as a pulsing drum like vibration while the spirit is maintained quiet within. So, warmth, weight, vibration, and also expansiveness your ordinary sense of the boundaries of your body, your sense of connection with Tian Di Yuan Qi, the original Qi of heaven and earth, your connection with the cosmos changes. So, you know, on a subjective level, that I think is what we're looking for. What am I looking for as a teacher? Most important thing is that you're following the principles of the art. That is the main thing. And they're outlined so carefully and specifically. And, it, and it, it's a challenge, uh, I think, for me, I would imagine for some of my colleagues as well, to try to explain the, these things clearly in English, because the Chinese language carries such rich connotations. So when you say fang song, relax, it doesn't mean collapse. I remember one of my teachers telling me, you know what is relaxed? A flower is relaxed. It doesn't use less effort than it needs, nor more effort than it needs to look beautiful, to be entrancing and wonderful. So let's be relaxed in that sense. I thought that was a great explanation. And when we talk about uh, opening, opening the joints, guan jie song kai, what does that mean? And why is the word opening used? Because when you close the joint, that is you lock the joint, you're closing the joint space. You're creating more wear and tear in the joints. So, you know, obviously we don't have time to go over each of the principles of Qigong, but I would say if you're following the principles of your art, whether it's Tai Chi Chuan, Qigong, or any martial art, then that's, the that's how the teacher measures whether you're advancing in it and whether you capture the feeling because we want not only the, the kind of mechanical precision, you know, how to step, how to shift your weight, the, the great alignment, the suspension of the head, the dropping of the weight through the feet. But we, we also want the spirit of the art to be manifest. So you want the, the 
mechanical side, the energetic support, and the spirit. And maybe that's the most difficult because that's the, that's the one that's, you might get it by a sort of osmosis, but you can't really teach it. So ultimately, what do you want to see in the student, in the Taiji trend student? You want to see that they have become the Taiji, that they're not just doing Taiji, that they are at that balance point that combines yin and yang, where the all the complement all the complementary opposites are in harmony, that they are the tai chi, that nei wai shang xia he yi, the inside and the outside, you with the universe, above and below, right side and left side. Today we might say the, say the right and left side, right and left hemispheres of the brain. Maybe the corpus callosum is the tai chi of the brain. We want all of these pairs of opposites to be in, in harmony. So anyway, that's what I would say are the main, the main things I'm looking for as a teacher, you know, that they've got the mechanical precision, they're following the principles, the, they've also realized the, the spirit of the art. They haven't gotten so entranced by the map that they've forgotten how to walk, walk the land. That is, it's, it's easy to do a sort of mental Qigong and Taiji and say, oh yeah, I've read the principles, I think I understand it. Guess what? You don't get it unless you practice as my colleague Harrison had mentioned so importantly, you have to ultimately get it through practice. So is there a point to measuring Qi? Yeah, of course. We're, we're in a world where science is very important and it has its place. There are conditions that we, we're so grateful to Western medicine. There are things that Chinese medicine, forgive me for saying it, maybe you don't agree, but there are some things where Chinese medicine does not address as quickly or effectively. If I were in a car accident or if I had a severe uh, uh, bacterial infection, I want to take care of the problem right away before it becomes something worse. I want to go to my doctor and get my you know, amoxicillin or whatever. But for long-term debilitating conditions, for prevention as adjunctive therapy, I think uh, Qigong and these Taoist related contemplative practices can sometimes be almost miraculous. So thank you very much. That was a that was a fantastic and very very detailed answer. Thank you so much for covering all the aspects of that question. Um, let's turn now, Master Moritz. How how would you respond? So first, I'll start by saying I'm not a scientist. I'm a mystic, um, and at the same time, I think that uh, uh, that the practice of qigong is a kind of science. And if we, uh, we, we have a, we're gonna make a trip across country well before we had GPS, but we, so, so we, we get a map of the United States and we pull out one map and it, it's, it's a map of the uh, migratory patterns of the birds and it doesn't have any roads on it. We pull out another map and it has the uh, mineral deposits throughout the, so, so, so we have to know we need to have the map of what we're actually working with. Um, I'm particularly interested in the interconnectedness of systems. So the relationship of heart rate variability, respiratory variability, the effects of mental emotional states and their correlation with posture, internal and external posture. So there's the shape that the body is on the outside, but there's the way that we hold tensions on, on the inside that are um, the, so, so, so going back to what is chi, what isn't chi? So, so when we talk about chi and qigong, people talk about this, uh, this profound, subtle energy in the body, but chi is everything and everywhere is it. it chi, chi is there's unformed chi and form chi, and it, it's 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 common. And so all experience that we have from the context of qigong, from the context of Chinese medicine, from the from this traditional way of seeing, every experience that we have has to do with chi. 
And if that's not amazing and profound, I don't know <laughs> what is. So the other aspect is not just uh, it, it is what I call the herbs and spices. So all the things that the body produces in response to whatever else has happened. And in, so you have an emotion, there's a, a, a mental emotional pattern, there's a pattern of, of holding in the body, a facial expression, or trying to avoid a facial expression. Uh, but there's all of these substances that are secreted in the body. And so in deep states of practice, there's substances that are secreted in the body because of those deep states of practice. And so if, if, we, if we try and just isolate, okay, th this, is, this is something that's neurological or th th this is something that's, that's uh, you know, a cardiac or respiratory or that we're gonna be missing a, a lot. Um, in terms of what I look for in as markers in people's practice, the, the first thing I look for, the primary thing I look for is change. Not saying, okay, you have to be able to accomplish this thing, but to see movement, to, 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 to see change. And that change, because I've, I've been doing this for a long time. And, and so uh, things that I think are very simple uh, aren't really very simple. And things that would appear to be only a very, very slight change cause a profound effect in the people that that change happens in. And so being able to So, 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 so th th this is something that, th that was mentioned so several times before is, is the, um, the proper practice, pra the practicing according to the, the proper principles. And if people are practicing according to the proper principles, then so the proper method, proper principle, then the desired effect will develop from that. And being able to allow that space and encourage that whatever slight change it is, that's what is going to nourish and, and continue in, in the right direction. So inside of that, looking for ease, for softening, for in increased presence, for uh, better sleep, for uh, increased cognitive function, better, better balance, uh, I mean, th th these are, are very simple things that you can see on the outside. A and then there's uh, you know, warmth in the Dantian and, you know, but, but I, I think one of the, I think that the term Qigong is actually very unfortunate because people then think that what's most important is Qi. And so there's a basic principle, uh, I think I, I talked about this before, lian yi bu lian qi. So practice intent, don't practice qi. Lian qi bu lian li. So practice qi, don't practice strength. Yi dao qi dao, qi dao li zi ran dao. When the intent arrives, the qi arrives. When the qi arrives, the strength naturally arrives. But here, so, so, so first, wait a minute, you said practice intent, don't practice chi. Well, practicing intent is practicing chi. Practice chi, don't practice strength. The strength that's being talked about is actually not, it, it, it's, it's not this strength. It's the internal strength that, it, that arises from the chi. When we talk about practicing intent, the most basic thing of practicing intent 
is what kind of intent are we practicing? Wu yi zhi yi shi zhen yi. Intentless intent is true intent. And so that, uh, I'm try, trying to jump ahead to the answer to, to one of the other questions, but, um, but looking for the markers that people are actually practicing according to the principles. And the markers of that are, are the desired results actually emerging from that. Thank you. That was, again, a very in-depth response to the question. Um, let's turn now to Master Yang. What do you think about this question of measuring? Uh, first, it's really depend on what is your outcome. What do you want to measure? Then you can decide, uh, you know, work with the uh, scientist and then um, the expert in the field and see what is the best uh, measurement tool. And you can measure that part. Uh, I think it's a very simple issue there. And uh, in terms of like as a traditional practitioner, uh, what I look at the science of the improvement of the students. And there are several things as um, our two teachers just mentioned, um, you look at their physical part is their alignment and it is uh, their movement, uh, their balance and so forth. But also you look at the energy. Actually for a developed eye, you can easily, you look at a person, is this person's energy good or well refined or low? Uh, you can easily tell that. And uh, also if you do Tai Chi and it can be easily measured, which is do push in, you cannot lie. You touch, you know, and whether you are making progress or not. And or even by shaking hand, you even don't have to push. You know it, very simple. Okay, and then, so second is uh, measure the chi part. Actually, this is a question I've been struggling for a long time because coming from China and with that, uh, you know, background, and also living in the West for this many years, often I face this question, what is Qi, how to measure that? Uh, I think the, the work done by the Neo-Daoist uh, between the third and the sixth century provide a great, great work, uh, a grant to bridge the East and the West and make everything so much easier. So let me explain a little bit. So for Qi, we all know um, the simple definition, I call that narrow definition is vital energy. The broader definition is based on the neo Taoist work is first nature, which includes life. We are endowed with this chi, which is this nature, this life. The second is the capacity, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the ethical capacity, as well as intelligence. And now all we have been talking about in the research field so far, we are talking about mainly the physical part, balance, blood pressure, immune function, and so forth. But the goal of the Taoist practice, as, as well as the Qigong practice, is to fully realize this capacity. And then through this many generations practice, the Qigong practitioner and the masters, they figure out 
some ways to really develop this energy, this capacity. So I think with the advance of technology and the medicine, we can start it getting into this emotional intelligence, wisdom. And I think all this has the promise to be measured. I just feel it's exciting. And it, at a, this is what we have done. The research is at the very beginning. And then with this uh, groundwork done by this three, uh, third and the sixth century, the neo Taoist, that's just amazing. When I read that part, I said, well, this provided this solution. And we don't have to argue, but you know, like uh, Ken just mentioned, the electromagnetic field of measure, that's great. But in addition, let's measure the practice method, how to advance all these several capacities. It's just amazing. I, I think it's for our neuroscientists, for our um, medical professionals, and, and there's a lot to do. And, and they're very promising. So, um, so that is, you know, based on that, and we can measure, if you follow the narrow definition, go ahead, measure the electromagnetic field. But you understand the broader definition, let's measure all the different domains we just dimensioned, we just talked about. Um, very promising. Thank you. It's a very hopeful answer. <laughs> just at the beginning. Um, I believe so. Well, I think related very much to, to that is while we're trying to adapt Qigong practices to a kind of modern medical understanding, one thing we see is a, a tendency to focus on specific conditions. So we see the, these Qigong practices like Qigong for cancer, for heart disease, for back pain, for depression, insomnia, fatigue, and so forth. Um, to what extent can these, the, the, the effects of the Qigong practices be generalized to be suitable for all people with a particular condition rather than responding to the particular needs of a particular person, right? And how have or would you choose to build a standardized Qigong routine for a particular condition that could be used in clinics, in research studies, and or in the general population? So Master Cohen. What do you think? <laughs> oh, you're muted still. Sorry. Sorry about that. So if, if you look at the book that has become the sort of standard textbook on clinical applications of Qigong in China, I, I think, what was it called? Uh, Qigong the Kushe Jichu, something, something like that. Scientific Foundations of Qigong. I think it was translated as Chinese Medical Qigong. And if you look up in the index, oh, let's say an autoimmune condition like rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes, and you see what kinds of Qigong are indicated for that condition. And now let's look up in the index what would be considered an opposite condition, that is uh, some form of immune deficiency, such as cancer. And now let's look at something completely unrelated, such as a non-union of a fracture, a, a broken bone that's not healing properly. In this, I'm giving you a hypothetical example, but I think it illustrates the principle. You may find that the same exact Qigong is recommended for all three conditions, even ones that are completely opposite. Because, and here I do take the, I think the traditional viewpoint, Qigong does not treat the Western categories of disease. It can have an effect, but the effect is generally much more global and systemic in the process of restoring overall health, well-being, connectedness, internal connectedness, connectedness to nature. In that process, whatever is out of balance, whatever the disease is there, is more likely to move towards balance but not because you have, as in Western medicine, a targeted therapy. You know, if you've got insulin, you know it's going to have an effect on blood sugar and you take it for diabetes. 
But if you're doing a Qigong for diabetes, even though there are some methods that have been found a little more perhaps clinically effective for diabetes, such as I think the Zhong He Gong from Wudang Shan, I think it's been used quite a bit for diabetes. Nevertheless, that same method is going to treat the entire person. So it's a, it's a systemic or global approach to health, but that confuses Western doctors and that scientific mindset because you know the physician looks at the index of that book and says, what kind of crazy thing is Qigong? You mean they're, they're treating a broken bone with the same technique they're using to treat glaucoma? Yes, because in general, again, even though in recent years we have found more clinical effect of one style of Qigong compared to another for a particular disease category, whether a Western category or a Chinese category, that idea of extracting Qigong from its original context, its original Taoist context of re restoring that state of unity and balance, of restoring your connection with nature, that new way of looking at Qigong is very, very recent. Remember the term uh, medical Qigong or Qigong really was founded post-1949, post-communist revolution. I think it was Liu Gui Zhen, often considered the father of modern acupuncture, with Hu Yao Zhen, uh, Feng Chang's, one of Feng Chang's Qigong teachers, who coined that term medical Qigong. So, you know, what? one of the, the books that I recommend to people interested in this different approach to restoring uh, wellness, if we want to call it that, is, I don't know if you're familiar with Rhonda Zhang's book. Uh, it's called E, that is Chinese medicine, E-Y-I, Masquerading as Medicine, subtitle, A Case of Chinese Self-Colonization. I'm going to repeat the name of that book. It's by Rhonda Zhang, C-H-A-N-G. E, that is Chinese medicine, uh, but the title is just Y-I, Masquerading as Medicine, A Case of Chinese self colonization. That is, what is the harm that is occurring to classical Chinese medicine, not the modern communist construct of TCM? What is the harm to classical Chinese medicine and to the yang sheng, nurturing life attitude of Taoism, when we start to accept the Western model of disease disease categories and how the body works. So as a, you know, I have an interest in science obviously, but my dedication is more to the Qigong viewpoint, to the Taoist viewpoint, and to what I learn from practice, primarily from my own practice. Also, of course, what I learned from working with, with students and clients, they're often my greatest teachers. And I, I still honestly feel that you really can't create a uh, standardized practice. This has been the problem with recent approaches in Chinese medicine that you, you look up the particular disease, I don't know, lymphoma or whatever it is, and you find the prescription. That's not how Qigong works. And I don't think that's really how Chinese medicine works. So again, uh, I, I don't, uh, as my, you know, to, to the dismay of some of my medical colleagues, uh, I don't think there's a way of creating a series of Qigong prescriptions. Rather, I would like to see healthcare professionals refer out to Qigong practitioners so they can treat or work with people on their own terms rather than having to fit into the categories of Western medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Master Moritz, what is your view? I, I believe you're still muted. So I think a big problem is trying to uh, treat the symptom and not the cause. And so it goes back to the context. 
that if the um, you know if you if you use really good medicine on your thumb and you take antibiotics and you hit it every day with a hammer, it's still you, you're you're not taking away the cause that 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 you're you're the, the reason that you need to treat it. So. There, there's definitely Qigong methods that are specifically good for the heart or for the kidneys or for sleep or for uh, causing the qi to move up, causing the qi to move down, to detoxify, to, I mean, there, there, there's, there's lots of different Qigong methods, but what's, what's appropriate? So the, uh, the Liu the, Zhi the Liu Qifa, this this uh, uh, very traditional method of uh, it's basically patterns of uh, sound with the exhale. And so there's there's some systems where you actually make sound, and some systems where you don't make sound. And the and the the earliest texts talk about um, you know it's profound when you can't hear the sound. And so, so I, I was talking about yo wei zhi fa and wu wei zhi fa, doing method and not doing method. So, so th this is a method in which the movement, the intent, the pattern of sound of breath, you, even though you can't hear the, the, the sound, the pattern, the sound pattern that the beings used with the breath accesses that organ. And so heat, toxin, uh, stagnant chi is uh, released from the body with the breath. So there's two parts of the practice. There's a part where there's the, the exhale, the inhale and the exhale. And then there's a part where there's rest. So the, the part where there's the exhale or the, the inhale, the, the, the inhale is tonifying, the exhale is dispersing. But that active part is primarily dispersing. And then you do the still part where now there's this space and the chi fills that organ and revitalizes the organ and revitalizes that system. But people who don't understand that pay too much attention to the outward part and don't understand, don't have the patience for the other part and they become deficient. So there's a, um, so, so going back to earlier question, so have a, a friend who's a, um, a Japanese jazz singer, uh, quite well known uh, in Japan. And she's very kidney deficient. And this, her singing method is this highly aspirated it's like all, all, all the breath is going out as she's singing. And so I, I taught her a method to help uh, gu qi, gu qin, to, to, to grasp the qi, grasp the essence, to, to strengthen the kidneys. And it got much better. But as long as she uses that method to sing, it's going to be trying to catch up for that method. And, and, and so the qigong method is the same. So we, so we have a Qigong method and we say, okay, this, this method is really good for congestive heart failure. But are you actually doing the markers that are, uh, that, that make it efficacious? And are you doing it in the, in the proper context? So, so I, I think that there are definitely methods that are very useful, but if they're, not understood in context, they can cause as much harm as they do benefit. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Master Yang. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the reality we are facing, uh, which is in how we bring this uh, 
art to the general public. And, and at the end, there are different ways we can deliver this um, service. And the one is the a general practice curriculum for the general public. And actually one friend gave me advice. I feel it's very interesting. I, I, actually, I've been using that, which is, she said, if you want really uh, using this art to help more people, you have to assume people are not interested in Tai Chi and Qigong per se. What they are interested in is their stress, their sleep, and their certain medical condition there. So which really bring a great challenge to our practitioners. Can we introduce the art without the jargons and still generate the effect. And for that reason, and we need to bring really the essential components of the practice and have the simple ones. Actually, sometimes the simple ones can be the most effective ones. And we bring this to the general public. I think that's the first area we can uh, provide to the service. The second, uh, that's the question you mentioned, is generate a standard uh, practice for a specific uh, population. I think it's a promising. For example, for people with balance challenge, which was my dissertation, you know, and then we recruited 99 elders. And my dissertation was how to help them within six months to improve their balance. And then I look at the traditional curriculum, which I grouped into six essential elements. And I pick up the ones, for example, standing. It's extremely important for balance there and bring that into the practice and also some Tai Chi form. And then uh, come out with a kind of like a general guideline for balance, have this. And also sleep is a big factor affecting our sleep. So the approach we can use is to work with scientists, to work with medical professionals, and study together what are the risk factors, and in two, including you know, the, uh, our previous two teachers just mentioned, some like uh, mind-body connection part, we just try to find out as many risk factors as possible, number one. That's the challenge. Number two is come back to the traditional practice. That's where our master teachers wrote there is which of the elements, everybody have different ways to categorize them. And then what I put is six. And then I say each of the elements, what's the potential benefit? And then come together, come out to the design. That is for specific condition. But as for cancer, as for you know, uh, heart condition, and then um, immune function, whichever, I think we can, it's, a, it's a possible we can come out uh, with a general practice guideline. Do we have that uh, correlation overlap between these different uh, conditions program? Of course, and then we do. But that doesn't mean this overlap will prevent us pr from producing specific program for special population. And then for individual difference, always we have a challenge. Everyone's different. So the way to get the service uh, in the meantime addressing the specific person's need is modify the practice. And for example, for balance, and then if people have pre-deconditioned uh, balance uh, situation there, you know, standing is essential, but you can do the standing later. First, using the sitting and the lying down to work on the relaxation. And again, as uh, um, Harrison just mentioned, relaxation doesn't mean you collapse there, but this is a high level relaxation and how we cultivate that in sitting and lying down meditation. Then you bring in the standing meditation into practice later. I think it's also possible. It is 
the teacher's expertise and decide how you tailor a specific guideline, the program to individual need. And then, so again, the key is understand the traditional practice. What's the potential function? And what's the capacity this specific element can help people to improve? Then working with the scientists, working with the doctors, find out, come together with the best uh, list of risk factors, and then using the curriculum to address this. So I think that's that's the promising area we can work on. Uh, yeah, that's my approach. Thank you. I, I think we have time for one more question, um, which is, how important is the cultivation of ethics or martial virtue or Qigong virtue for learning Qigong and experiencing its effects? Is this something that researchers should account for in their studies? And how should it, the, these ethics, this virtue, along with uh, deeper levels of skill in the practice, be best imparted to students? Master Cohen. OK. Um, first of all, let's uh, remember that the term Martial. I mean, some people might wonder about the term martial virtue. Well, isn't martial arts kind of aggressive? What does that mean, martial virtue? Remember that the word martial rule actually means to stop weapons. It doesn't mean to fight. It doesn't mean to express aggression. It means to stop weapons or finding a way to avoid a potentially dangerous or aggressive situation using minimum effort necessary to stop a fight. I just wanted to clarify that. So is the cultivation of ethics important? Uh, I would say yes, for several reasons. One is that she is not just a kind of neutral energy. It's an information carrying, let's say field. It's an information carrying field. So it is infused by your state of mind if you're working as a chi healer, practicing transmitting chi to a client, then you you have to take care of your your stuff, your own shadow, your state of mind, because your chi can transmit your compassion, your kindness, your caring you're wanting to be of service. And who would want someone to work on them as a chi healer if they're upset, if they're angry, if they're a greedy person, if they're hateful, if they're racist? I wouldn't want that person working on me as a healer because they're going to transmit that kind of energy. It's not only that intent directs the chi, but to a certain extent, chi is consciousness. Chi is intent. Intent is chi. So, you know, I'm not sure if that's what was implied in the question, that aspect of ethics, but that's the first thing that I think of, that we don't want to transmit and we don't want to move chi within our own bodies with anger and confusion and frustration, but rather we want to follow, or at least I want to follow Lao Tzu's guidelines. Remember one of the earliest uses of the term Sanbao, the three treasures, was not to Jing Qi and Shen, but we find this same phrase, the Sanbao, the three, three treasures in Lao Tzu, in the Tao Te Ching, where he says his three treasures that and I believe he says that we should guard them well are compassion, frugality, and not daring to be first. We could say humility. So there's a, a good example of how important ethics is. Remember also that the Tao Te Ching was not, as far as I know, originally the Tao Te Ching, it was the Te Tao Jing. 
virtue came first. To achieve de virtue is to de Tao, is to reach the Tao. And I know there's one etymology of that word de that shows a, a farmer, one version of the character that shows a farmer in his or her field. So the virtue of the field is its ability to grow crops. So virtue is actually what gives us the greatest potential for developing our chi. Uh, many people assume that the Tao Te Ching has always been the most popular work attributed to the old child, or perhaps Master Lao, Lao Tzu. But actually, I think a far more popular text generally has been the Taishang Ganying Pian, the treatise on uh, response and retribution or moral responsiveness, where it speaks about how immoral behavior feeds the worms that infest the three Dantians, the three primary energy centers. And it recommends that one of the keys to long life, what we could call effective Qigong, is living with integrity. And I think integrity is a nice possible translation, or at least suggest the connotation of the word dub. And, and what is integrity? It's being true to your deepest principles, especially in the, in the face of adversity. At the entrance to Bama Longevity Village, one of the few blue zones in China where you have a high concentration of centenarians, of people who live to over 100. In fact, I think it's the highest concentration in China. At the entrance to that village, there is a, an inscription in stone that says, Wei Ren Zhe Shou, only the kind live long. Well, we might think, hey, there are plenty of scoundrels that live to age 100. It's true. But what kind of life do they live? Are they living in heaven or hell? I'll let you decide which that is. So uh, I do agree that only the kind live a long and good life. And the other important reason for virtue that we can't ignore is that are we doing Taoist cultivation only for ourselves? Uh, I'm actually asking the question, is there the equivalent of, let's say, a Mahayana approach in Taoism, that we're not crossing the river to Nirvana on a raft, but on a ferry boat, and we want to take everyone with us as much as they're interested and willing. I would say one of the goals of a good life is to use our knowledge and gifts, our chi, our chi skill, our chi gong, in service to others. So again, that implies a kind of moral in, imperative. So that would be my answer. How, how do we, uh, I think the other part of your question was, how do we kind of demonstrate or impart this to students? I don't think there's any other way than by living it. We, we cannot coerce people into moral behavior. Remember Lao Tzu says, Shang de bu de shi yi yo de. The highest virtue is not here. I'm going to give you somewhat, uh, I'll use a bit of poetic license in translating. The highest virtue is not coercively or self consciously virtuous and is thus virtue. It cannot be forced. It doesn't work with shoulds and should nots. It doesn't work to simply say, Okay, to be virtuous, follow X, Y, and Z, follow these laws. Because again, Lao Tzu says, the more laws there are, the more thieves and robbers abound. However, through self-knowledge and cultivation of emptiness, then I would say that virtue and virtuous behavior 
manifest of themselves effortlessly. And that can only be imparted through example and using, to borrow a Buddhist term, upaya, skillful means, to help students have the courage to look at themselves and to get their ego and their fixed self-identity, their idea of who they think they are, out of the way. So anyway, thank you for that uh, uh, beautiful question, whoever uh, posed it or thought of it. And thank you for your beautiful answer. Um, Master Moritz. So I, I would like to uh, briefly answer this question and the next two, because I think they're, they're very important. And so I, I will try and be very succinct. But I, I think that um, the cultivation of the is very important. And I mean, the, fundamentally in Taoist practice were uh, shojan, were cultivating the genuine, were cultivating the real. And the, the fundamental aspect of that is what, what is true. And th that's an aspect of the middle. And so without that cultivation, then you can't return to the middle. So, so none of the other elements are able to, they, they, they all return to the middle. Uh, and how, how do you uh, transmit that? by being the model. And how, how is it that you're the model? You do it over and over again. So, so there's this um, jump to this rectification that you're continually, that it doesn't matter what's happening, you're continually returning to the middle. And so, the next question was, if you had to name one key habit or practice that is most essential in making progress in Tai Chi and Qigong, what would it be? Continually returning to a state of Song Jing. So that continually returning to the state of Song Jing is returning to the middle. And it's only by that cultivation of the middle, only by cultivation of the that you can so so, so um, if you're not where you are it doesn't matter where you go you won't be there so it's if what you're doing is not moral then what you're doing isn't true then you're not where you are. And so wherever you go, you can't actually arrive in a real place. And the other question is about this in in fire. And this is a, a So, so there's a question I often see in clinic, what Judan uh, Shi termed in fire, a Gordian knot of symptoms that shows up in many chronic illnesses. Is there a Qigong, Neigong set that addresses the connection between ministerial fire of the kidneys, the stomach, qi, the liverine, the hardine, and where a patient might learn it? So I'm going to go back to what, what I started with, which is it has to be the, the whole context. That, that, that you can't do, you, you can't go, okay, I'm going to use my strong intent to move through the channels and scorch the channels and generate this fire and then have some method to fix that while I continue to do that. So, there, so there's lots of methods that are useful for this. There's methods and most of the methods are wu wei fa. 
that not not doing methods. So you you take a posture and fall asleep. Hot foot bath. There, there's some self massage methods. There, 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 there's there's lots of different methods that are useful for this, but only if they're accompanied by a change of the context that's generating it. Okay, I said I'd be brief, I'm done. Well, thank you for responding to all those questions. I think that's uh, very helpful for everyone, everyone listening. Um, and Master Young, you get the last word, a question of ethics and whatever else you want to respond to. Okay, the ethics, I, I think it's, um, First, it's very important, and the second, you know, it's a simple because it's part of the practice. Let me explain a little bit. Um, it, it's so interesting. Three of us, and uh, all studied with this Chinese legend in the Chinese martial art history, Grandmaster Feng. Uh, we are all very fortunate, and then first, I really want to honor our teachers uh, taking this opportunity. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we study with the legend, we, want, we ask ourselves a question, why he becomes so good? And then the kindness, my observation is one of the reasons he became so high level there. Let me tell you a very short story. Back in 1983, and after I first studied with him, and I was in Shanghai, and then I traveled to Beijing to study with him. Uh, after one train uh, ride from Shanghai to Beijing, I was broke. And after I arrived with Beijing, I, I stayed with my friends, asked friends to stay with them, and also sometime I stay in the park. So one day he find out, he said, you know, you cannot stay in the park. You know, come, go stay with, with me and my wife. And I said, well, I'm really humbled. And then I said, I'm honored, but I was also hesitating. The reason, his, uh, his house, we call the house actually, it's uh, probably is the size of the studio in New York City. You know how big that is, divided by a wood and a paper divider. And think about the privacy they give up and they allow me to stay with them. And of course, later I moved to Beijing to, to the law school there and because I want to follow him to study Tai Chi, that's the only way I moved there. And for three years on and off, I was living with him and his wife. I think that's kind of a kindness, generosity, that tell us all his virtue. And that probably one of the reasons explain why he was so good. And then there's a famous saying in Chinese martial art, Qigong, including Qigong training, which is how high your virtue level will decide how high your qigong in martial art level. Very simple. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, the teachers looking for disciples or indoor students. It is similar like you, a professor looking for five-year PhD student. You want this candidate to be intelligent and have good moral standard. So this student might carry your legacy there and do good things to the world. So the teachers, they are serious about finding the students with good uh, virtual level there. And also like uh, humility and respect and all these different qualities will decide how far you can go. And, and then, uh, but another good thing is the Chinese philosophy strongly believe one of the schools, which I agree with, is we're all born with innate kindness. And we all know what is right, what is wrong. 
inside our heart. We don't need anybody else to tell us. It is called the Liangzhi or good knowledge. And then our life journey is extend our innate kindness. And then so, you know, as I mentioned from the very beginning, the definition of qi is also your ethical, your moral capacity. The practice is about to awaken the kindness in ourselves and others. And also very practical reason, your virtual level will affect your sleep. Think about if a person was very kind, very generous, this person probably more likely to go to the bed at night with a very peaceful mind versus, you know, if you are greedy, you think about hurting other people, learning martial art, guaranteed you probably more chance not to be able to sleep well. So all these things tied together. So it's not, you know, whether you should count this, it is part of the practice. And with this practice, you know, for all of us, we can extend our kindness to our family, to our community, and to the world at large. That's my answer to this question. Uh, last one, I think uh, I want to mention, which is the one uh, suggestion number, only one practice you recommend, I would recommend working on nurturing. And when we nurture ourselves, we nurture our physical, we nurture our emotional, we uh, nurture our uh, spiritual. And, and also with this bigger principle, we can find all this moderation, come back to the middle and not overdo. And all the principles mentioned is under this big umbrella of nurturing. This will help us to reach high level and fully develop our potential as well as our students potential. Thank you. I would like to thank all three of our speakers tonight, Masters Kenneth Cohen, Harrison Moritz, and Yang Yang, for their kindness in coming here to share their knowledge and wisdom with us and really help nurture our understanding and our practice as we move forward in the world. Um, and I'd like to also thank all of you who've come here tonight to spend time with us, uh, learning and, and sharing in this moment. And uh, I hope all of you are doing well and have a wonderful weekend. Uh, we will be going on hiatus in this talk series for the next month. And we'll begin again in the fall uh, with a new series, new round of lectures. So in the meantime, wish you all well. We'll be looking forward to you the next time. Thank you for the hard work and you and your team and, and uh, Dr. Roth and everyone. Thank you very much for putting this together and also working with our great colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you.